This week on CrossFeed. You say Yahweh, the Pope says no way. Joe Biden, Roman Catholic. Sarah Palin. Pentecostal? Lutheran? Maybe? And Buffy the Vampire Slayer attacks churches. Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. I am Pastor Jim Butler in uh, beautiful dead of Massachusetts, and um, yeah, forgive the weird stuff here with the face tonight. I uh, got some lighting problems over here, and uh, maybe I'll try and go get it adjusted and figure it out a little bit later, but... Uh, he looks like a Phil it, Collins uh, right album now, cover. Right now, I just kind of like I'm half there. Okay, cool. <laughs> if you say so, I won't argue you. I'll argue the point. But earlier, it wasn't a problem, but I don't know why it is now. Well, we were having some goofy things happening tonight anyway. But uh, it's good to see you again. Good to be back. Uh, last week at this time, I was in Oklahoma, where I was attending my son's graduation from uh, basic training. So... Um, Really a neat thing. Uh, anybody who's ever get a chance to do this, to really watch these guys and to see them marching and stuff, it's just really cool. I have a uh, uh, an, an additional news story, um, sort of. I got the weirdest phone call last week. Uh, it was one of those, like, recorded sales messages. And uh, it yep. turns out that... The they they've made these uh, statues available. They're duplicates of um, Michelangelo's um, Mary something or other. Um, it's some Latin name, Pieta or something. And um, this I had it all written up, and I can't find the um, the note that I had about it, but uh, I I looked this up because there's only a limited number of like so many reproductions they can make of this or something like that. And for one, I was kind of irritated because they're selling them on eBay. I'm like, since when does the Pope sell stuff on eBay? And and I'm thinking, what is he, you know, I was just teaching about, uh, you know, Martin Luther and the sale of indulgences and stuff. And I'm thinking, what is he trying to paint another Sistine Chapel and, you know, (laughs) needs more money for that or something? And so I, I just out of curiosity I had a I had to look these things up and to see, you know, what's the deal here that they're talking about. And this right here is what they're selling. Okay. And the I saw it actually has a bid on it. And I guess they're selling more than one. But the bid is for five thousand dollars and it says reserve not met. So they are selling these things for just a whole ton of money. And I just thought if this is a you know some official thing that that they're doing it just doesn't seem quite right to me. But that's my and it, I I looked you won't hear this story anywhere else this is a crossfeed exclusive. <laughs> Impressive. So that done. Well, thank you. <laughs> Where should we start? Speaking of the Pope. Yeah, might as well. Let's let's let's. Well, I don't know. Should they were going to get into a lot of uh, um, political stuff? Oh yeah, let's go. Let's go with the Pope. Yeah, let's go with the Vatican here, okay. and uh, and yeah, do, do those two. Okay. Um. We, this is kind of interesting. All right. The, there's a note from the Vatican um, that has reiterated, I didn't know that this was the case before, um, a directive that the name of God um, is not to be pronounced in the Catholic liturgy. Uh, the name of God, meaning as sometimes it's used, the Tetragrammaton. There you have it behind Jim. Um, most of it, anyway. There you go. And um, 
in in Hebrew, it's uh, it's pronounced Yahweh, and it's now there's no vowels with it because in the Old Testament there's um, as it was originally written, it only had consonants. You just sort of had to know what the vowels were uh, based on the the structure of the of the consonants in that. Um, later on, there was a group called the Masoretes that put vowels in. Well, whenever a um, a Jew would be reading his um, his Tanakh, his Old Testament, he would whenever he came across God's name, he would say Adonai which means Lord. And that tradition is carried through in most English translations of the Bible, where you'll see Lord in all capital letters. And wherever you see that, that's um, that's that name, Yahweh, which the King James translates Jehovah. And that's a whole other story about, uh, it has to do with, they took the, the vowels from Adonai and used those with the, the consonants from Yahweh, and then you go through Latin and stuff, and you end up with Jehovah. So the Pope says, uh, you really shouldn't say the name Yahweh. So I just did like, what, three, four times? Fear of a name only increases fear of the thing itself. Well, they, they, uh, you know, traditionally, uh, English Bibles have not used that name. Uh, traditionally, English Bibles have used uh, the name Lord, all in capital letters. And um, we have a, a good, uh, I, and actually, to be honest with you, I haven't u- used it um, since I left seminary. I think that was about the last time I ever worked. Uh, curiously, by the way, the only Bible that I have that does it, uses the name consistently is my Jerusalem Bible, yep. which was translated by Roman Catholic scholars. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of an odd thing. Um, I mean, <laughs> one of the things is that we don't even know if that's really the correct spell, it's a, the correct pr- pronunciation. Uh, it fell out of disuse uh, among Jewish uh, Jewish people uh, sometime following um, the exile into Babylon in the year 586, sometime in what we call the 400 silent years, between Malachi and Jesus, that change went over. Uh, it was really part of the Pharisaical, the, the uh, work of the Pharisees that, uh, you know, you didn't want to misuse the name of the Lord your God, so they just wouldn't say the name of the Lord your God. Uh, Matthew is very Jewish in his writing and talks about then, you know, always the kingdom of heaven, never the kingdom of God. And, uh, even Jews today, even now, with the word God, will say, spell it uh, capital G dash D. Uh, to, you know, show this, you know, or just GD to show, uh, us, you know, the sacredness to the name. So, you know what? I, I'm, I'm kind of with the Vatican on this. I don't see there's a real reason to do it. And I know if I was to start doing it in my congregation, it would sound really weird to my congregation's ears. And personally, I find it kind of grating. Um, now, there are ancient Greek uh, manuscripts that date back to about the same time as the New Testament that refer to the God of the Jews, Yahweh, and they they use the beta a b um, because it was a it could also be pronounced as a a, a v instead of a w there, and um, which is the same in Greek. And so we get the vowels there. Now, you know, whether that is, um, is, is correct, you know, because it's their attempt using their alphabet to write it. Um, there was some pronunciation going on if, if they had, um, had heard the name. Um, you know, it's not something that people are used to. The other uh, translation, actually the translation that I really like to use for study, um, if I'm not using the original languages, um, that does use it is the World English Bible, which is a uh, uh, free Bible, uh, very recent translation um, that's available on the web. 
Um, in fact, that's the abbreviation for it, World English Bible, W-E-B. Um, that was intentional. And, um, and that one's actually, if you're familiar with like the New American Standard, it's even more literal than the New American Standard. So it's a great study Bible, but it's not the kind of thing that reads very well. Um, but it translates, it actually writes out Yahweh in those spots. So hmm. when I'm doing my personal translation, I write it, um, I write it out because just so that I know that that's what it is. Um, so if you go through my study notes, uh, you'll find it all over the place. Um, but you know, I, I think probably the best reason not to use it is just because it's not what people are used to hearing. Um, <laughs> I, I, when I was reading this story, I couldn't help but think of that scene in, uh, Monty Python, the life of Brian, where they're, they're stoning somebody. Oh, why are, why is he being sewed? Oh, cause he said the name of God. Well, what's that? Jehovah. And then someone whips a rock at the guy that, you know, that says that. What was that for? Well, you said it. <laughs> and, and pretty soon there's rocks flying all over the place. And so, it, I, you know, here's the thing. if It's okay to say God's name, right? The question is, how are you saying it? And and that's, you know, the this tradition came about, this, like Jim said, okay, well, if we don't say his name, we can't use it improperly. Well, yeah, but... The thing is, God wants us to use his name. Whether you use it, um, whether you say Yahweh, whether you say Jehovah, whether you say the Lord, whether you say Jesus, um, which is a little more specific. Uh, but, you know, God has given us all kinds of names by which he is known. And the, the point is, is that we want to share his name. Um, we want to, you know, tell others of his name, um, because his name is, uh, sort of a description of who he is. And in fact, the, the name Yahweh, uh, is usually translated something like I am, but, um, it kind of loses something in English because it's not just I am in the sense of like, I exist, but it's, it's an active verb. So it's like, um, I am with you. I am involved in your life or, you know, or something like that. There's a, it's, it's, I am doing. And, um, and of course we see that throughout the Bible, God's involvement in people's lives where he lives out his name and, um, and he gives us his name in baptism. We're baptized into his name. We become you know, part of his family. We're adopted into his family. And so, um, you know, God's name definitely is something that we want to use. Um, but we want to use it properly and, you know, respectfully. So, you know, I, I think personally, I think that, that, you know, like in the new Testament where it says Jesus Christ is Lord. I mean, if you understand that this is, they weren't just saying that he's like the head honcho, but they were saying Lord. I mean, really they could all caps that one too, even though it's written, uh, curios Lord, um, and they didn't write out the name Yahweh, uh, what they did do, you know, what they're saying here, because people were used to, if, if they had written Yahweh, they would have been stoned to death. You know, so there was a certain sensitivity to the, the Jews that they were writing to, and probably have it too, because that's what they were used to saying. And so, um, but when they say Jesus Christ is Lord, they're saying Jesus Christ is Yahweh. He's the same God that freed the, you know, that appeared to, uh, to Moses in the burning bush and that, that freed the Israelites from Egypt. And, and, you know, he's the same God as the God of the old Testament. It's the same guy. So, uh, which really blows Marcion, but that's something else entirely. That's for sure. But, uh, a, a interesting article and, uh, uh, interesting that the Catholic Church has brought that up. But let's go from uh, the sublime to the ridiculous here. And uh, let's head over from the Pope to Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I just thought this was a, this, I, I thought this was a great story. Let me get Buffy up there. There's Buffy. Um, 
And um, now this was uh, the story we we picked up from Fox News, but it was originally from the Telegraph. And they, 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 according to the article, there's a a study out that says uh, a bunch of women have been leaving the um, the, the, the the main line. Orthodox or Christian Church, uh, and going into more things like Wicca and uh, other relig- female-based religions. Uh, about they're saying fifty thousand women a year have deserted congregations over the past two decades um, to become Wiccans. <laughs> get, well, it says yeah, they are becoming attracted to the pagan religion Wicca. Um, uh, where females play a central role, which has grown in popularity after being featured positively in film, TV shows, and books. Now, I'm trying to figure out which films, TV shows, and books have pushed it regularly, and I can't believe that. Okay, if you're if you buy 50,000 women a year over the past two decades, that's 20 years. Are we saying a million women? Well. Wicca's popular, but I don't think it's that popular. And this is from Britain, so I don't know if it'd be that popular in Britain. I don't know. Who are the Britons? Well, we all are. You know, the the thing that you kind of get in this article is is the idea that, you know, women are, are sort of put down in the Christian church. And... um. You know, and, and, and this is, and, and I'll say this even coming from a, um, a denomination where we don't have women pastors. Um, and that is the Christian church does not put down women, at least not biblical Christianity. Um, you know, especially in its time, uh, Christianity, uh, was, uh, was really the, the vanguard when it came to, to women's rights. I mean, you know, Jesus appeared first to the women after the resurrection. The women are, you know, they're the witnesses. And, um, you know, anybody else would have said, uh, yeah, you don't have women as witnesses. They're not considered reliable witnesses. And, you know, women are really lifted up in, in you know, in Ephesians, when it talks about the, uh, the role of the husband, the role of the wife, it's, you know, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave up his life for her. You know, that's how important women are. We need to be really respectful to them and, and that. And so, um, you know, I, I think that there are, uh, places where women are put down and, and that's sad. But boy, you compare that with like Islam, where, um, there are many, uh, imams who, you know, publish books on how to beat your wife and, um, in places where the bruises won't show and, and things like that. I mean, and you know, that's only certain, uh, versions of Islam, but I mean, still <laughs> we're, we're pretty far from that. I've never heard of a Christian church that would espouse anything remotely close to that. See, you know, one of my questions and I, I like to know more about this study because, um, it keeps talking about the church, the church, um, and then later on, it did, you know, it um, her research uh, published in a book called Women and Religion in the West cites an English church census that has found that more than a million women worshippers have left churches since 1989. Well, okay, that they've left is one thing, that they, you know, have become wicked or pagan is another. I don't know if you can make that uh, claim. Um and the other question is, 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 is this all churches or is this uh, simply uh, the Church of England? I mean, is this simply Anglicans? Because, um, you know, the other side of that is as churches have become more liberal, people have just left. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. they're not interested in, in hearing um, messages about, um, you know, uh, social structure or, you know, uh, that what my sister-in-law walked into, and I probably said this one before, you know, why you should join a union. Or the sermon I've got from a guy, you know, why you should be in favor of nuclear freeze and against capital punishment. I mean, you know, if you're going to be doing stuff like that, you know, basically what we do, a comment on the news, uh, not too many people want to go to a church like that. Yeah. I mean, you can tell just by our subscriber numbers. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) 
I mean, that's just reality. Um, and also, the other thing is that there are all those who are just talking about, you know, post-Christian Europe. I, you know, I had some, um, a member of a past church who went to uh, India on a mission trip. And she came back telling us everything that happened. And she said she met with another group that, that was with Youth with the Mission or something like that. And they had gone to England. And they were like, there's nobody here. They, they look at you funny if you start talking about God. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, wasn't it uh, the, for, the former prime minister, Tony Gordon, uh, was uh, talking about, um, I probably got his name wrong, uh, but, you know, he, he you know, talked about at the end, you know, yeah, he was a faithful Catholic and he went to Mass and his faith was very important to him. He goes, but I would never say that here in England. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I'm yeah. not so convinced the person yeah. is, is working, is right. I don't know yet, Pinky. Well, you know, especially you're talking about the Church of England. I mean, we've we've talked about that at length uh, in other episodes about how um, you know things have gotten so watered down that people are leaving left and right. It's on the verge of splitting. I'm surprised it hasn't yet. Um, you know, there's a lot going on with that too. So, yep. hey man, this don't feel right. My donkey senses are tingling all over. I don't have a good transition. <laughs> I don't either. But let's leave then. Well, okay. Well, we we dealt with the we dealt with the um, uh, the Pope. We dealt with uh, Sarah uh, 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 Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So let's deal with Joe Biden, who claims to be Catholic. So we'll go back to the Catholic here. Yep. And then we'll go back to the Vampire Slayer. Um, <laughs> Uh, we've got uh, Joe Biden, uh, the uh, Obama's choice for uh, vice president, and uh, and it's official now that he's the um, the nominated or the the nominee for vice president from the Democratic Party, and he is a Catholic. Um, he when he had uh, brain surgery in 1988. He asked doctors whether he could tuck his rosary beads under his pillow. Um, and he has offered to shove his rosary down the throat of the next Republican who tells him he isn't religious. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, he's gotten a lot of flack because he's Roman Catholic, but he's also pro-choice. And, uh, and very staunchly pro-choice. And... Um, so I, I thought there was a real there's the question. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's basically this, um, how, okay. So here, here's, here's the teaching at the grown Catholic church in terms of, 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 of life situations. And, you know, here's Joe Biden over here. Can you claim to be a good Catholic when you're sitting back saying, I disagree with what the Catholic teach, Church teaches in this area? That's really the question you got to ask. Right. But, you know, at the same time, you know, I thought about this. Okay, because there's uh, uh, bishops that are saying, uh, as long as you're going to hold that position, you really shouldn't take communion because you're not uh, a loyal Catholic. Okay. So, so here's the, this is a, something that we as confessional Lutherans have to, um, have to deal with uh, all the time is where's that line, right? Because if he believes all other stuff, he's a, you know, he's a practicing Catholic and, um, and believes very much in, in most of the other things, um, you know, of the Roman Catholic church. I mean, I know a lot of Catholics who don't believe in purgatory, um, and, uh, you know, for that matter, you know, here's look at it from us, okay? As as uh, as Missouri Synod Lutherans, all right. We also uh, we actually agree with the Roman Catholic Church on life issues that uh, that life begins at uh, I'd say conception, but I'll actually say fertilization since conception's been kind of redefined. Um, that you know, at, at the moment of that that union. Um, as soon as it's an embryo, it's a human being, and um, and deserves all the rights. And um, of course, uh, Obama, when at the 
um, when he was at Saddleback and Rick Warren asked him, uh, you know, where does life begin? He said, well, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> when he asked John McCain the same question, McCain, without batting an eye, said, at conception. And just, that was it. And um, so, you know, there's, there's definite differences. But so here's the question. All right. Jim, if you knew that one of your members is, uh, is staunchly pro-choice, and disagreed with the, or either, um, on the one hand, possibly disagreed with the question of where life begins, or, um, dis or or said, uh, as there's a, there's a quote here, that uh, I lost it now. Uh, here we go. Um, Obama campaign is ultimately premised upon Catholic social teaching, like care for working families and the poor and the foreign policy premised on peace over war. Democratic efforts to tackle social and economic factors that contribute to abortion hold more promise than the Republican efforts to criminalize it. Now, this isn't a Biden quote, but this is somebody who's speaking on his behalf. All right? So they still say it's wrong, or that it's bad at least, but that we should try to um, to do things to... Uh, where people are not going to be wanting to have abortions instead of just saying it's illegal and, and stopping it that way. All right. So if you have someone who, for one reason or another, is pro-choice, would you tell that person they shouldn't take communion? Now uh, let's be reasonable. We can resolve our differences peacefully. No, because... In my mind, if I tell somebody you can no longer take communion, I've effectively told them they're no longer Christian. Because that's the idea of being excommunicated. You're out of communion. And to tell somebody you can no longer commune, you know, says, okay, we could, I would say we need to sit down and talk about this issue. We need to take, take a look at what God's Word says about this. Um, and it, it could be, I mean, a lot of, the quote you just read in a lot of ways is right. I mean, uh, the fact of the matter is, yeah, there is more to this stuff than simply trying to uh, make ab abortion illegal. Uh, of course, it won't work in Massachusetts. It'll be perfectly legal anyway. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of stuff on abortion winds up being in Roe v. Wade, which was just a badly decided, uh, bad decision to make. But you could also, or it was badly decided, but it can, if it was reversed, it would go back to the states. The states would start making their own decisions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, 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 uh, uh, but that's, that's, you know, that's a whole other issue. And you can do your best to criminalize it, or I guess, or make it illegal. But the, really the key thing is you gotta to talk to people about changing their hearts. Where are their hearts at? And that's what we're about, really changing our hearts. I remember one time, um, you know, preaching on, on the whole issue and said, yeah, yes, it's a, it's a horrible thing. Yes, it's a sin. We, but we could make it completely illegal. We could shut down every clinic in the United States. Guess what? Our job's not done. Our job's not done until we bring them to the church and we share with them the gospel of Jesus. That's what we're about. Yep. And you've heard me say this before, if you're a longtime listener. Um, but we need to, as a church, be very careful when we talk about, you know, we talk about, um, you know, the value of human life and, you know, that, that people are so valuable that Jesus was willing to die for them, including these little babies that are being killed. Right. And, um, and which, by the way, is, why it's a sin is because these are our lives that God created. And, um, and so at that point, you know, we're saying, no, this person isn't important enough, um, that, you know, that somebody else's, um, in some cases convenience, um, or, you know, or other, whatever it happens to be is more important than this person's life. And I think anytime that we, um, that we say that someone's life is secondary, 
to someone's rights, um, we're walking a, a very dangerous path. Um, but at the same time, we also need to make a point of saying that Jesus died for the person that, um, that had the abortion, that felt like that she had no other choice, um, you know, for whatever reason too. And, and we need to talk about forgiveness. And that's just, that's so important because, um, abortion usually is followed by feelings of guilt. And, um, I mean, I'd, I'd be a little bit concerned about somebody that didn't feel guilty about it. And I would even question whether they were really being honest about that. I got a bad feeling about this. So we need to make sure that we've got forgiveness offered to them. Um, and to, you know, I, I can't imagine that there's a lot of abortion doctors out there that chose, you know, that really, I mean, I guess they make a lot of money, but it's not the kind of thing where you can kind of go home at night and feel good about what you did that day. And so they need to hear about Jesus too. Have you found Jesus yet? That's true. And to remind them of that. It's so easy, I think, for us to often wind up in very judgmental places. And when we're dealing with things in a political process, where you vote yes or no, it's very easy to, to demonize the other side. It's very easy to want to tear down the other side. It's not easy to want to say, these are real people dealing with real struggles. But they are. And uh, the decisions are never easy, and we need to. I think we need to 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 deal with that. On the other hand, I remember back when I was um, my first church. I, I, it was an article I wished I kept by a, a, a guy in Los Angeles who's out doing abortions, and um, he, he said his reason was the, the final reason he, he gave it up was a woman who said she did not want to. Um, she, she did not want to have the child because she was going on a cruise and she didn't want to be fat. So, you know, I wish we could. The problem is, is that with, uh, with and, and, and with Senator Obama, it's a good example. You know, once you say, come on, we need to come some some reasonable things here. Some reasonable safeguards. Um and yet he said no, 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 no. Uh, even you know, uh, uh, even a child who was born alive, you know, survived an abortion. Nope, doesn't deserve to live. Um, and that's where I think it gets very upsetting. That it just seems there are almost no limits. Um, you know, I can certainly understand understand in some situations, but you know. Reading that article from that doctor, and I wish I'd kept it. it. You know, he did say there are some people; it's selfish reasons. But under our, our, our under our um, under the Roe v. Wade, it can be for any reason at all. Well, one in three the entire nine months pregnancies ends in abortion. One in three. So I mean, I'm sorry, but there's just not that many emergencies out there. So, yeah, you know, when you make it easy, it's sort of like divorce. Divorce used to be hard and people didn't do it as much because it was easier to just work things out. When you make it really easy, then it's like, uh, you know, and I'm not saying that this is always the case, but in too you know, it's gotten so common because it's easy because it's easier than working things out, you know? And I, I'll tell you one thing. That, that really gets me fuming is when I hear the, the expression, every child a wanted child. When I think about all of the parents lined up to, um, that would love to adopt, uh, um, a baby and to say, well, this child's not wanted. It may not be wanted by, um, by the, the birth parent, but that child is wanted by somebody. So, It's a it's a very frustrating issue. 
Yeah, especially when you talk about you know t- talk about the all the the, the 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 crime of of how many of our soldiers have died um, in the in wars, and, and specifically, you'll hear a lot of times talking about uh, the deaths since we started since we invaded Iraq, and you compare that with the number of of children that have died from abortion in that same amount of time, and there's no comparison. I mean, it's like ten hundred. I mean, it's like hundred fold, at least. Interesting thing for me was when my son was born, uh, premature, at age thirty-two weeks, and uh, sitting there going, you know, if we'd wanted to, we could have aborted this kid. You know, at the same time, you know, here they were working very hard, you know, uh, uh, to, to save his life. And if we wanted to, we could have said, nah. You know, the same thing could have happened. Yeah. Well, let's move on from this one. Uh, we're, we're probably getting people tired of listening to it. And deal with uh, Sarah Palin here. Who's very much against abortion. Yes, very much. Um, one of the questions about her is exactly, uh, oh, that's not, the, yeah, we're back to Buffy the Vampire Slayer here. Um so where is she? There she is. Oh um, nope. <laughs> there she's not. Okay, well I'll, I'll find her here real quick and put her up there. But um, on the um, yeah, let's go down to that for our background, and I'll try and find her. Um, one of the questions about her is what church does she go to? And um, the story that uh, we actually came across said that she was um, – talks about her being a um, Pentecostal. She would be the first Pentecostal member. But interestingly enough, and the reason I brought up Lutheran in the beginning is that somebody had uh, argued that um, she might be uh, Lutheran. Uh, the Wall Street – there she is. The Wall Street Journal actually said she may be Lutheran. So uh, I thought that was kind of interesting and – but apparently she doesn't really belong to any one congregation. She's post-denominational. I am not a committee. Uh, she, uh, she does not, her uh, spokesperson said that she does not consider herself a Pentecostal. Her primary place of worship in Juneau is said to be the Church on the Rock, which is an independent congregation, so non-denominational. It was founded in January of 2000, but she also attends different churches. So, yeah, she, she, you know, she she loves her uh, the Assembly of God Church that she grew up in, um, but is, you know, doesn't consider herself. And we'll get back to that church in a little bit uh, because we have another story related to that. But right, but for a while, uh, yeah, when she was the mayor of Wasaila or whatever it is, a little 9,000-member town. There she was, the member of the Wasalia Assembly of God. So, um, you know, this is just, it's one of those non-denominational churches are becoming very popular um, in uh, among, and it's, they're talking here in this story about a sort of combination of evangelical and Pentecostal, but most Pentecostals are evangelical, aren't they? Yeah. So I, uh, I didn't quite uh, understand that. Yeah. And from that, the other thing we've learned about her is she's not a um, she's not a deep theological thinker. <laughs> and uh, it's, um, there's a seven-minute video. I don't know if it's still uh, there at the website of her former church. Uh, or do you have it? I've, I've got a couple of clips. The, the sort of because it's actually longer than that um but yeah we've got a, a couple of clips here um i don't remember which order they are and so we'll we'll take them one at a time um let's start out with the war one and that's this one that our leaders our national leaders are sending them out on a task that is from God. That's what we have to make sure that we're praying for, that there is a plan and that that plan is, is God's plan. So 
uh, bless them with your prayers, your pr- prayers of protection over our soldiers. And speaking of track. Yeah, that was because her son uh, is uh, track is getting. By the way, what's with these names? <laughs> yeah, I I'm in high school. Oh, I got tricked this afternoon. I'm a track leader on today, you know. I mean, oh, I'm wondering. Her husband is is part uh, Inuit Eskimo, and um, and so I'm wondering if these are Inuit names. That's the only thing I can I figure out because they're not even spelled. I mean, like track is spelled T R A C, which you know I think of like like track phone, you know. I don't know. You have another quote here. Yep. Uh, so that one she's talking about uh, about the 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 war. This other one's about the Alaskan pipeline. I can do my part in doing things like working really, really hard to get a natural gas pipeline, about a $30 billion project that's going to create a lot of jobs for Alaskans and we'll have a lot of energy flowing through here. And pray about that also. I I think God's will has to be done in unifying people and companies to get that gas line built. So pray for that. But I can... I can't hear you. Hell, can't hear you. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. There, is that better? Yeah. Ah, it helps if I turn off the mute. <laughs> oh, it probably does. So, so this is you probably heard the oh, train going by here. Um, I don't know. You got quieter too. I hope it didn't mess up our audio. But um, anyway, so what happened? You know, people are, are freaking out about this, and they are going, "Oh, well, she's, you know, she's she's hearing, she's saying that the the war is God's will and the pipeline is God's will. Like she's got some kind of, you know, is she Pentecostal? Boy, it, it sure sounds like it from the way they're talking, you know? Um, but, but here's the thing. You, you really have to kind of look at what she actually said. Okay. And so talking about the war, this is what she said. She said, pray that our leaders, that our national leaders are sending soldiers out on a task that is from God. And then she's, she says after that, that's what we have to make sure that we're praying for, that there is a plan, and that plan is God's plan. Now, she's not saying that, like, President Bush talks to God and that God told him to do this, okay? This, I, I read this, and it reminded me of a quote, and I don't have the word-for-word quote, uh, but this is from Abraham Lincoln. and. It goes something like this. Somebody came and said, well, you know, Mr. President, we're going to win this war because God is on our side. Or, or do you think that God is on our side or something like that? And, and he said, it doesn't concern me so much that God is on our side, but rather that we are on God's side. And that's really how I understand what she's saying here. She's saying, you know, we're doing this. Let's hope and pray that we're doing the right thing that we're doing what God wants us to do. Right. So I, that first quote, I didn't really have a problem with. I mean, if, if you look at what she actually said, instead of sort of taking it out of context and, and, um, and only, I mean, only listening most of the time I see people quoting this, what they're, they don't quote it exactly. And they kind of twist it to, you know, to sound like something else entirely. So, That one, you know, I I don't really have any concerns about. Now, this other one about the pipeline. Now, we also have to look at that one again and look at the whole quote. Because even these clips, the clips I pulled off of YouTube and and they're clips from an opponent. You know, that someone's going, oh, look at this, isn't this scary? Right? So they didn't even show the the whole clip. But I didn't, otherwise it was like, 
uh, seven minutes and there was, I saw it on, it was like 15 or something like that. So, you know, I didn't want, I didn't want the whole big long thing, but, um, she says, I can do my part in working really, really hard to get a natural gas pipeline about a $30 billion project that's going to create a lot of jobs for Alaska. But I think God's will has to be done in unifying people and companies to get that gas line built. So pray for that. Now that part, I don't have a problem with because this is like, um, Unless the Lord builds the house, the workers work in vain. You know, if God doesn't want the gas, the pipeline built, it's not going to be built. You know, not that necessarily that there's going to be, you know, that, you know, I, I sort of question with some of these things, uh, business ventures and things like that. How much of this, you know, God sort of takes a hand in um, and how much of it he just gives us the abilities and says, go for it, you know, and. And if we, if we do it, it, you know, not the pipeline is neither good nor bad. It's what we do with it. So, you know, some people with various ideas on, uh, on energy and things, you know, may have, may believe it is really good or it's bad, but, um, you know, it's a tool like anything else. This, the second part of it was the part that, um, where she kind of strays a little bit. And there are, there are, the people at this church would, would probably agree with her. Okay. Um, she says, I can do my job there in developing our natural resources and doing things like getting the roads paved and making sure our troopers have their cop cars and their uniforms and their guns and making sure our public schools are funded. But really, that stuff doesn't do any good if the people of Alaska's hearts aren't right with God. I have no idea what that meant. This is what we call the theology of glory. And the idea is that, well, if, if everybody in Alaska gets their hearts right with God, that, you know, if they all really firmly believe in this, then it'll happen. And that's where I would say, um, your, your Pentecostal roots are showing. Yeah, I, I would say the whole thing was a mess. Uh, you know, because it sounds almost the beginning point that, you know, God's will is this pipeline being there. Um, it's really a mixing of the two kingdoms. Why in the world, I mean, the, the pastor of the church is having the governor come in and speak about her pipeline and, you know, other things. I mean, that's just, it's just totally inappropriate. I would, you know, have her stand up there and talk about her faith and how that influences her decisions and, yeah, I pray for the decisions I make. I, 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 you know, that that would be very appropriate. This kind of stuff. I mean, where it almost sounds like it's God's will. And uh, you know, I, 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 I think she's an interesting choice for vice president. But no, she is not a theologian. Uh, and uh, you know, they just in what she said there was probably you know, absolute silliness as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then just to, um, um, uh, uh, is the, uh, 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 question about, uh, what, what Jewish voters think, and, uh, particularly part of them is because, um, they uh, had a, uh, Jews for Jesus, uh, there. And, uh, speaking, and, uh. Yeah, this was, uh. Some other places. What, two weeks ago, there was a, a representative from Jews for Jesus. Was it like the president? Um, Brickner is his name. And, yeah, they're making a big deal out of that. Now, well, part of it is Brickner described terrorist attacks in Israelis as God's judgment of unbelief to Jews who have embraced Christianity. Judgment is very real, and we see it played on the pages of the newspapers and television. It's very real. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, the problem is, he wasn't the regular pastor. This was the guest speaker. And I get, you know, uh, um, yeah, some people are members of churches where people say things. And again, this is, this is going to be a, uh, that, that maybe, 
I would never say that. But there's no proof that she believes that. Uh, just this guy who came into her church on a, to speak on a Sunday said that. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you can tie that in to anything else. Well, they're comparing this with the whole Jeremiah Wright thing. Okay. Which is, is, I don't know. It seems to me like a ridiculous comparison because like Jim said, this isn't her regular pastor. This was a guest speaker that she happened to be there. Now I have seen people from Jews for Jesus and uh, the Missouri Synod uh, version of it called apple of his eye um, that we've talked about in the past, um, Jewish evangelism organizations. And I've heard him talk and I've never heard him say anything like this. So, you know, if, if I had to bet money, I'd say that the pastor of this church probably had no idea that this guy was going to say this. But what are you going to do? You're going to all of a sudden stand up and go, oh, no, no, that's, you know, it's like you're going to show respect to your speaker and just let him say his piece and, you know, and just kind of hope that nobody was listening real closely and, you know, <laughs> let it go on. I mean, I'm a little more careful about who I let as a guest speaker. But, you know, I've had, I've had, when I was on vacation, I've had pastors fill in for me that said stuff that I came back and, and I found out that these things were said and I said, what? <laughs> you know, and I, I was on vacation at the time, so, you know, I wasn't aware of it. But people were there present, but just because they were there present doesn't mean that, yeah, this is what I believe, this is what I agree with, and, and I'm attending church because of what this guest speaker came and said. So, I don't know, I think... I think it's being blown out of proportion because they're looking for something, you know, this is the whole, it's a political process. You dig for dirt on people, you know? Well, and I think it's interesting. I mean, you know, this one guy uh, from the National Jewish Democratic Council, you know, she's totally out of step with the Jew, American Jewish community. She's against reproductive. I'm not in this for you. I got a lot of Orthodox Jews I know who would, you know, say, be very much against to see that. Uh, you know, uh, she has said that climate change is not man-made. Um, once again, I, uh, you know, that's, I don't know if that's a, 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 a tenant of Jewish theology. <laughs> you know, and then uh, later on it says, uh, you know, uh, on the other hand, a Jewish guy for, uh, for uh, McCain, uh, so, you know, this isn't going to be, this, this isn't an issue. Um, and then, um, two of, uh, two Jewish guys from Alaska, Rabbi Joseph Greenberg, who I think would know what Jewish people think, um, you know, said, uh, she's a, a friend of the Jews. Uh, most likely, being a, a Pentecostal evangelical person, she's probably, um, uh, 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 Israeli first millennialist. And uh, going to be very loyal to, to the state of Israel. I mean, but again, you know, I I, I actually love the headline, by the way. There, um, from, this is from Politico. Um, you know, Jewish voters may be wary of pa Palin. Or then again, they may not. They may not. Yeah. Well, they might. <laughs> Some of them might like her and some of them might not. It's sort of like, uh, you know, I, I've been listening to the speeches. I, I subscribe to the uh, podcast so that I can uh, listen to all the speeches and stuff like that. And I noticed on iTunes, the you know, they have reviews. And um, they you look at the at either one of the uh, the the DNC or the RNC uh, podcast feeds, the reviews, they all they both have three stars. Because all the reviews are either one star or five stars, <laughs> depending what your political bent is. It has nothing to do with the quality of the content or, you know, or the, um, how well produced it is or anything like that. Um, <laughs> it's just, do you agree with them or not? Right. Well, I got a friend of mine, you know, a note from a friend of mine today who's a very, very, uh, definite Democrat. And he's like, oh, yeah, there's so much negativity and there's so much uh, uh, um, um, ad hom argument, you know, going out there. Like, there is none of that in, De in, in, in Denver. <laughs> I'm sitting there going, <laughs> oh, "Planet of the Homeless." 
Yeah. Anyway, speaking of what planet are you from, what do you people are doing, we've got some interesting emails the last few weeks. Um, yeah, let's see. From, especially from YouTube. I, I can't figure out why people are, are watching some of these. But, uh, one guy said, uh, speed it up. Uh, you can condense this in 10 minutes. I don't know. Drink a lot of sugar prior to recording <laughs> this. Uh, then, uh, speaking of our, I guess this is Kenny Hotz. Was he the guy? Um, this is the, the banner. The, the Jesus Sucks banner. Oh, is that who he was? Yeah. How many people can you offend? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. He's got, Kenny Hotz has got, you're kind of a funny retard. <laughs> I think you talk about me. <laughs> and then he says, yeah, because then he, the next one says, Denim isn't beautiful. Denim is, uh, is trashy. The mall sucks. <laughs> you know, well, it's not the greatest mall, I agree. That's why I go to South Shore Plaza. Um. Uh, and then he's this other guy, the devil has all the good music because Christians can't be offensive or cool. Yeah, and we're proof of that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and there was another one. What was the other comment that we've gotten? Well, we've had this sort of ongoing thing with this uh, this Mormon guy. Um, He's been watching. So um, I, I don't know his name. It just has a... a handle but um thanks for watching I'm, I'm glad that you know he's been watching a few of our episodes and um so I'm, I'm glad of that and his his most recent one um because he's this all goes back to that uh mormon nudist um guy and uh and he he kind of took it personally we talked about this last episode um and and we did we disagree with certain things um in the mormon religion and specifically we've been talking about the sort of burning in the bosom, the idea that um, that if you feel that that is the truth, then that must be. Which you know, I just watched the original Star Wars trilogy uh, with two of my daughters, and um, you know, it's it's sort of like Obi Wan saying, "Trust your feelings, Luke." You know, or or Darth Vader going, "You know, I'm your father. Search your feelings. You know it to be true." You know, well, that's not something. Feelings only react to your knowledge, right? You cannot determine truth of any kind based on your feelings. It's, that's putting the cart before the horse. You know, just because you believe something to be true doesn't mean it is. And so um, he says, so your logic is that because someone says that they're of God and you say that you're of God, you can't disagree with them. Well, if two people disagree, at least one of them has to be wrong. Maybe they both are, but at least one of them has to be. Because this is, we're not, you know, we're talking about who God is. Different people have different beliefs, but this is a, a matter of fact. It's not a matter of opinion. You can't have an opinion, I mean, really, about who God is. You can have a belief, but that's very different. There's, those are two different things. And, uh, you know, I can... I can believe that, um, you know, that my grass is on fire. It's not, by the way. Um, and, but that's not an opinion. I can't have an opinion and, and say, well, you know, personally, I think that my grass is on fire, but you're welcome to believe that it's not. And, um, and, and, and we're both right. You know, either it is or it isn't. Well, the same with God. Either God is like the Mormons describe him or he's not. And so it's it's one or the other. And uh, also, we talked about the Mormon doctrines that are contrary to the Bible. He says, no, Mor no Mormon would say that because it isn't true. Well, that's something we disagree on. And uh, while, you know, we may have to agree to disagree, that's not the same thing as saying we're both right or, um, you know, we we read the Bible very differently. But only one of us can be right, you know. Uh, or again, maybe both of us are wrong, but you know we can't both be right about our understanding of what it says. And uh, finally, it says uh, you should learn LDS doctrine before you go telling us what we believe. Um, actually, we have a pretty good handle on what the Latter Day Saints teach. Uh, I've studied it extensively, uh, so um, and in fact, there's probably depending how far up. 
into uh, the the temple thing that you are, I probably know more about a lot of it than you do. Okay, um, just because there's a lot of secret things that um, you're not supposed to know until you get into it further, and um, you know the the different ceremonies and things like that that um, I've seen them reenacted by ex temple Mormons. And, um, so there's, I, I posted a quote and feel free to pop over to YouTube to, or to, to read, um, what I wrote there and stuff. But, um, you know, basically as far as contrary to the Bible, uh, the Mormon church teaches that you've got to be good in order to achieve, uh, their definition of salvation, which is for men becoming a God of your own planet. Um, and you know, the, the Bible says that if it's grace, it's no longer works. And if it's works, it's no longer grace. And so it's, it's one or the other. You, you can't have both. And, but the, um, Latter-day Saints teach both. But as Jim said, um, in a previous episode, their teachings change from time to time. And, um, and so as long as you have that, you know, you can say, well, you know, this is what God used to say, but he changed his mind. And, um, which really puts your whole salvation on very tentative grounds, uh, or tenuous, I mean. And, um, because, well, yeah, Jesus died to take away our sins and, and we're going to be saved because of that, unless he changes his mind. And while you can argue that, um, that, well, he wouldn't change his mind, um, how do you know? He's God. So if, you know, if, um, if we're misunderstanding that, um, you know, please, uh, clarify for us. I, I'd be happy to, to discuss this further. Um, or, you know, if, or if you'd rather, if you'd like to discuss it, uh, more than just on a, a public bulletin board, you can, um, you or anybody else for that matter can send us an email at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Um, or you can uh, follow me in Twitter. My Twitter ID is Crossfeed News. So, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from any of our listeners or, and, uh, and I mentioned iTunes reviews before. We'd still love to have anybody, uh, if you're listening, if you use iTunes, uh, pop over to the podcast directory there and, and leave us a review. But we do thank you for watching and listening and taking part, and we pray that God would be with you and with our nation as uh, the conventions end and the real uh, election stuff now begins. And you start getting all those annoying phone calls. Not in Massachusetts. Yeah, well, you know, Iowa first in the nation. <laughs> we were really glad when that first caucus was done. So things kind of tapered off for a while, but now it's going to start up again. Woo! <laughs> Now, like I say, Massachusetts is surely the wonder dog. As long as they have the D behind their name, they're going to win. So it doesn't make any difference in the state, <laughs> which is nice. I was in a battleground state four years ago when my mom died. Couldn't believe all the commercials and stuff that I saw none of. It was it was nice not to have to deal with it. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, God bless you all. Thank you for watching. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless you.